Hello, everybody. It's good to be back with you. I haven't recorded a new lesson for 341 in, in quite some time. Most of the lessons that I recorded um, were recorded um, one, two, and, and some even three years ago. So a lot has changed since then. Uh, we live in a world of COVID-19 right now and um, lots of uncertainty in different things. And so interesting time to be alive, but I am grateful to be with you today. Um, this lesson that I wanted to share with you is, um, I call it my potpourri lesson, meaning it's just kind of a smidgen and a smackling of a whole bunch of different topics all mashed together. And these topics really don't have a lot to do with each other per se, um, but I couldn't really find a good place to fit them in. So maybe you could call this lesson like my Isle of Misfit Toys. Um, but they're important topics by themselves. And so I want to make sure that I cover them uh, because especially if you go on to more advanced topics of solo mechanics in your education and in your career, these topics are going to be very useful to you. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to talk about um, are PQ diagrams. Um, I always joke and say you should mind your P's and Q's, right? Uh, yeah, I know, lame dad joke. But PQ diagrams are an important concept in geotechnical engineering. And uh, another name for these is stress paths. So by now, uh, my students who are watching, you have had some experience dealing with Moore circle and, and drawing Moore circle for a lot of uh, different, say, triaxial shear tests. So look at this plot here on the top. Each of these are different Mohr circle that may have corresponded to a test. Now, you've all had the experience of saying, okay, I've got to get the uh, Mohr Coulomb failure envelope for these circles. And so the way you do it is you, you try to fit a tangent line, but how do you know where to draw that line? It's, it's tricky. You kind of wish there was a way to automate it. Not to mention just all those overlapping circles, it gets messy, it gets hard to track. It really is a pain. <clears throat> so if we make a couple of assumptions, we can really simplify this plot. If, for example, one of our assumptions is, and it's a critical assumption, that the circles we draw are always centered on the x-axis or the normal stress axis. If, if that assumption holds, then we can characterize each one of these circles by just focusing on the top point of each of these circles. With the top point, the very top of the circle, I know the center location of the circle because that will be the same stress value for the top of that circle. And I'll also know the radius of the circle or the shear stress involved. So with a single point, I know everything about that Mohr circle. So if I plot just the tops of those circles, then I get a, a set of these points right down here, and that's the plot that's below. Now, um, the other thing that we're going to do to distinguish these, these, these new plots of these points uh, from the more circles shown above is I need to change um, how I quantify my axes. So I'm going to now quantify the axes in terms of Q, which represents deviatoric stress or shear stress. And it's simply, uh, as you can see, Q is just equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's simply the radius of my circle. So Q is just the radius of the circle. And P is sigma 1 plus sigma 3 divided by 2. That's just the coordinate of the center point of the circle. So now we have P and Q. So <coughs> with these points, these, these points, by the way, or these types of plots are what we call PQ diagrams. Um, the prime that we have infers, in this case, 
that these are effective stress more circles. We could have a prime on the Q2, but it, it doesn't matter because whether it's total stress or effective stress, the radius of the circle is the same. But uh, there can be differences um, in the horizontal location uh, in terms of um, total versus effective stress. In other words, uh, my circle can shift to the right or the left if I have excess pore pressure, but my radius should remain unchanged. So with that being said, you'll often see uh, P prime and just Q without a prime. Uh, it, it basically means the same thing. Uh, or these things are also called stress paths. So with those points now, you can imagine, you know, as engineers, you know what you want to do when you see points line up like that. You, you just are dying to fit a trend line through there. And so you can, you can fit a trend line through those points now. And the angle of that trend line we'll call alpha. So alpha is, is similar to phi, the, the friction angle of the more Coulomb failure envelope, but it's not exactly equal. They're, so they're related, but they're not the same thing. Because remember, alpha is the angle of the line or the envelope that goes through the tops of the circles that aren't tangent to the circles, like with the more Coulomb failure envelope. So this modified failure envelope goes through the tops of our Mohr circle. And so it has a, a y-intercept equal to m. And, and again, that is similar, related to cohesion C. And uh, we already discussed alpha. So the equation for this modified failure envelope is given here, where q equals m plus p prime times tangent of phi, or tangent of alpha, I'm sorry, tangent of alpha. So again, you can see how it's similar to the more Coulomb failure equation, which is C plus sigma times tangent of phi. Very, very similar, but different because now we're going through the tops of the Mohr circle, not through the, the, to the tangent points. So the cool thing about this is this is something you can automate in a spreadsheet and you don't have to draw more circles anymore. And you don't have to manually draw tangent lines anymore. Your Excel spreadsheet or MATLAB or whatever program you're using can automatically calculate the, um, the intercept M and the angle alpha. So uh, why do we do that? Why do we care? Um, well, we care because it's easier to compute for one. Um, but the nice thing is using alpha and using M, we can calculate phi and C and go back to more Coulomb. All we need is the relationship to do that. I like this figure here because it shows the, the difference between the more Coulomb failure envelope and the modified failure envelope. So you can see this line right here, that's the more Coulomb failure envelope, it's tangent to the circles, and just slightly below it is its cousin, or its sister, the modified failure envelope, and that goes through the top of the Mohr circle. So these equations right here are how we can convert from alpha back to phi, and from M back to C, or cohesion. And so from here on out, when you perform triaxial testing, and you have all that data from a triaxial test or from a direct shear test, you should be able to compute phi and C very, uh, automatically in your data by just setting up your spreadsheet to compute alpha and M. And then you can compute um, from those terms, these, uh, the more Coulomb strength parameters. Very, very useful stuff. And by the way, uh, the stress path, when we talk about stress path, um, the nice thing about just 
tracing the path of the top of the Mohr circle is we can see the progression of the Mohr circle on its way to failure. So we can see if Mohr circle is, is getting larger and going to the left, which would imply um, contraction and positive pore pressures, or we can see if it's going to go to the right, which would imply um, dilation and negative pore pressures in the soil. We can tell a lot about what's happening with the shearing in the soil by just looking at the direction of the stress path. That's more advanced than um, we need to cover for 341, but in uh, advanced soil mechanics in 641, we cover that topic a lot more. Okay, total change of subject. Let's talk about sensitive soils or soil sensitivity, and in particular, quick clays. Now, um, some soils, some soils in nature, they have a peak or an undisturbed, undrained shear strain that is much greater than the residual or the remolded undrained strain. So in other words, if we were to put a soil like this into a triaxial test and we were to measure the deviatoric stress that we applied versus the strain, the, the, the vertical strain that occurred in the soil, we would see something that looks like this where uh, the soil would show resistance, show resistance until it hits its peak, and then all of a sudden, it would just collapse. And we would see um, hardly, uh, well, we would see a much, much less amount of resistance uh, in order to induce strain. And so um, these types of soils are said to be sensitive. They're sensitive because strain triggers them to uh, essentially soften and, and changes their soil structure and hence they lose that strength. So we can quantify a term sensitivity. Sensitivity is, um, is something that we can, we can measure we can, and, and we can characterize in a soil. And it's simply the ratio of the undisturbed, undrained strength that would be, um, you know, related to this guy versus the um, remolded or um, the high strain strength, and that would occur down there. So that ratio of those two uh, strengths is what gives us sensitivity. So all soils, all clays, um, have different levels of sensitivity. Now, most clays in the United States are going to have sensitivities that are less than four. And so if it's less than four, it's common, it's fine, it's a normal clay, not normally consolidated, it's just a, a normal clay with normal shear strength behavior. Uh, between sensitivities of 4 and 16, it starts to get sensitive. If here in the U.S. we have a clay that um, has a sensitivity greater than 16, we typically call this a quick clay. And 16, I mean, you think about it, this ratio, you know, of the peak to the residual of, of ratio of 16, that, that's a huge drop in strength. And so we rightfully should be concerned about that because if we induce any amount of strain in that quick clay, it's going to give us, um, uh, you know, maybe, what, what would it be? One, one fifth or so of, the, uh, of its undrained strength. So it's going to lose almost 80, 80%, 84% of its strength. That's crazy. Now, that, that's here in the United States. Um, our friends across the ocean, the Scandinavians, they laugh at us. They laugh at us because we call a soil with sensitivity greater than 16 as quick. They've got soils that um, are very, very sensitive. And, and so they've defined quick clays that have sensitivities greater than 50. That's unreal. And they have extra quick clays 
that have sensitivities greater than 100. That's uh, really incredible when you think about it. So, <clears throat> where are most of these quick clays that have sensitivities greater than 50 or even up to 100? Most of them are located in uh, the Northern Hemisphere in places like Scandinavia and Eastern Canada. They've, they've got other places around the world, but, but these locations are where they're most predominant. And um, these, the way that these clays formed is really, really interesting. They, they originally formed as marine clays in a marine environment, so beneath the ocean, and the salt that was in the ocean at the time these, these clays uh, particles settled and formed at the bottom of the ocean, uh, the, the salt made the, uh, the double layers in these clays very, very small, very thin. And so the clays formed a flocculated structure. And as long as that salt, as long as that sodium chloride stayed in solution and was present, then uh, the clay maintained its its flocculated structure. But over time, and a lot of geomorphological change, like the recession of the glaciers, um, tens to hundreds of thousands of years ago, and other tectonic forces, a lot of these areas in Scandinavia, Eastern Canada, experienced geotectonic uplift. So they rose up out of the ocean, and, and those clays that used to be beneath the ocean were now exposed to all of the elements of the atmosphere, and particularly um, fresh water. And so uh, as it rained, as, as precipitation occurred, fresh water began to flow now through the soil. And the, the, uh, the salt in the pore water began to cling to this fresh water and just leach out and begin to leave the, the clay. So once you remove the, the um, sodium chloride, now we have a problem because the double layers now get bigger, but the clay is still in a flocculated state. So it becomes what's called metastable, meaning the clay is in a flocculated manner, but it doesn't want to be flocculated anymore. It's looking for any excuse any excuse to become dispersive. So the slightest little strain, the slightest little disturbance, and those particles effectively collapse. And they, they orient themselves, they spread themselves out, and, and um, it can be very, very devastating. And, and in a short amount of time, you can see some significant and, and very rapid physical changes in the properties of these clays. Okay, um, by the way, I'm gonna come back to this real quick. Um, at the end of this, this lecture, I'm gonna show you a web address and, and down in the um, description box for this video, I'm gonna provide a link to a, a very informative and interesting video about quick clay landslides. And, and one particular quick clay landslide that occurred in Scandinavia in uh, the, either the 1960s or the 1970s. It's, it's a famous or maybe an infamous landslide called the Rissa landslide. And um, you'll be able to see in that video, they demonstrate quick clay. And, and you can see just how this clay behaves when, um, when, when it's strained or, or when it's disturbed. It, it's really quite remarkable. Okay, last topic of my potpourri lecture here is the topic of thixotropy. Um, I've always liked to uh, present this topic in terms of superheroes. Um, now, if, if Clay was a superhero, if, if Clay was one of the X-Men, Clay... Uh, easily, easily would be Wolverine. Because Wolverine's superpower is his ability to heal himself very rapidly. And, and clay has the ability to heal itself uh, over time. 
It has the ability to regain its strength over time. And different clays can heal themselves at, at different speeds. Some take a really long time. Others can heal themselves relatively quickly. And so um, on this plot, I have time versus the strength of a clay, the shear strength. So if this value right here represents the undisturbed shear strength of the clay, and we don't disturb it, the clay maintains that strength, but all of a sudden we disturb it, and oh, the clay lost its strength and went down to its remolded shear strength, which is down here. If we just left the clay alone from that point, it would begin to re-harden. And over time, may develop all the way up, potentially all the way up to its original undisturbed strength again. And even if we disturbed it again, and it went back down, it would still follow the same path. Hardening, re-hardening over and over again, as long as it had a period a period to rest and to regain that strength. Now, not all clays show full thixotropic properties. Some clays are just partially thixotropic, which means that after they have their uh, disturbance and so they go down to their, their remolded shear strength, they only partially reharden. So, uh, that is only a fraction of what the original undrained shear strength was. And so a soil that, that only partially rehardens is called partially thixotropic. All clays demonstrate some level of thixotropy. And so it's, it's an interesting property to understand with clays, and it also explains why one of the reasons, and when we get later in the semester to understanding why it's a bad idea to have clay as a retaining wall backfill, it's one of the reasons why um, we don't want clay behind a retaining wall, because it cannot maintain a shear plate in it. It heals itself. Okay, now here it is. This is the uh, link to the Rissa landslide video. Obviously, if you click on it here, it's not going to do anything. Please, um, when you end this video, just go down to the uh, description box for this video. I'll have a link down there that'll take you to this video. It's about 20 minutes or so. Very, very interesting. I uh, highly recommend it for Friday night entertainment or to do with your date or your sweetheart. They'll be very, very impressed, and you'll learn something too. So uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to cover these topics. Uh, I hope you stay safe, and I hope you stay sane and connected with people the best you can in, in these challenging times. Um, I, I think about my students a lot during these times, and um, I pray for them a lot. I know that each one of you is, is struggling in your own way through these challenges, and uh, I just want to give encouragement and a, and a big virtual hug to encourage you to keep to keep pressing forward and doing the best that you can. And, and I know that um, times will will get back to more predictable and, and, and safer times. I'm, I'm confident of that. And with that, I appreciate your attention, and I will talk to you soon.